Now, as you look at the New Testament, you notice there are four gospel accounts, four accounts of the life of Jesus. And each gospel account presents Jesus in a slightly different light. The Gospel of Matthew presents Jesus as the King of the Jews. He's the promised Messiah of the Jewish people. So as you read through that book, you notice over and over again, it says, thus it is written and thus it was fulfilled. And so he he goes and quotes all these Old Testament prophecies and how Jesus was fulfilling those. Luke presents Jesus as the Son of Man. Speaks of his humanity. It's written by Luke. He was a doctor, so he would have been interested in that kind of thing, in the humanity of Jesus. John presents Jesus as the Son of God. And so it speaks of the deity of Christ, that he was God's Son, God in human flesh. No other book in the New Testament presents Jesus in such a light as the Gospel of John in that he was God in human flesh. When we get to the Gospel of Mark, it speaks of Jesus Christ as being the suffering servant. And the, the key verse in this book is Mark 10.45, which says, what well, Jesus is speaking here, and he says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And so, that is the key verse for this whole book. Jesus is the suffering servant. Now, as you look back to the Old Testament, you'll notice there are two kind of veins of prophecy that weave throughout the Old Testament. On the one hand, you've got the Messiah being a conquering king, that he was going to come and he was going to rule and reign. On the other hand, you've got the Messiah was going to be a suffering servant, that he was going to come and die. Now, the ancient Jewish rabbis, they couldn't understand how one person could fulfill these two ministries of the Messiah. And so they started coming up with theories that there would be two Messiahs. But we know as we look back now that Jesus himself fulfilled both roles because in his first coming he died and suffered. But in his second coming he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years, isn't he? Now, so as we look through the book of Mark, we're going to notice something. The book of Mark is the shortest gospel account. If you look in the book of Matthew, it's got 28 chapters. The book of Luke's got 24 chapters. And the book of John has 21 chapters. But Mark has just 16 chapters. And it moves in kind of a fast pace. It has the, these um, sayings like, immediately he went here. And as soon as this happened, they went in this, to this place. That's the kind of theme you get throughout this book is it's very fast paced Mark wrote it to the Romans and it has sort of that Roman mentality to it okay let's get the job done let's let's go from one thing to the next by the way this is a perfect book for the TV generation we are the TV generation right we've grown up with it we move from one thing to another and so this is an excellent book for us on the life of Christ Now, Mark was a young man when Jesus was crucified. As a matter of fact, many believe that he wrote this account about himself. If you will turn with me to Mark chapter 14. This may be a personal account of Mark here. Mark chapter 14 in verse 51. This is when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and had been arrested by the Jewish leaders and by the guards. And in verse 51 it says, Now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young men laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Now it doesn't present him in a very good light, does it? And you'll notice as you read through the New Testament that the writers themselves don't present themselves in, in a very good light. They recognize their own faults and failures. And this is one of the things that proves to us that this indeed was written by God through men. Because if a man really wrote this and it came from him, you'd be sure he'd present himself in a good light. But here, this is a little account of, of Mark in his own gospel. 
Now, church history indicates that Mark got his information from the Apostle Peter. In fact, Peter may have led Mark to Christ. In 1 Peter 5.13, Peter calls Mark his son. So in other words, his son in the faith. And so many people believe that he led him to Christ. Mark's mother was a woman named Mary. And she was a wealthy woman who lived in Jerusalem. And she was a believer. And she had a, probably a large home where she opened it up for the church to have prayer meetings. And as a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 12, when the Apostle Peter had been thrown into prison by Herod's, uh, Herod the Great's great-great-grandson, he was in prison, he was chained between two guards, and it says that the church was constantly offering up prayer to God for him. Well, in the middle of the night, uh, an angel came, bright light shone in the prison. The, cha- he, the, the angel said, get up, arise quickly, and the chains fell off as he, as he rose. He got up and he left the prison. He walked past the first set of guards. He walked past the next set of guards. He gets out to the, the gate which led to the city and the gate just opened on its own accord. And he walked into the city and then the angel disappeared. And suddenly, Peter thought to himself, God must be in this. <laughs> must have been an angel that set me free. And just as he thought that, he walked over to the house of Mary, John Mark's mother. And he knocks on the gate. And, of course, they're having a prayer meeting inside. And this little girl, Rhoda, she comes up to the gate and she sees Peter. (gasps) It's Peter. And she shuts the gate and she runs inside and and Peter's still there at the gate. And she goes into the prayer meeting. She says, Peter's outside. You need to come and see this. And they're like, ah, come on. You can't be outside. You just, it must be his angel. He says, no, 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 come on. So they go out there and they see Peter there. And he, and he tells them the whole story of what happened. It's an interesting story, isn't it? Because it shows you, first of all, the link between Peter and Mark and Mark and his mother Mary. But it also shows me something else. These people were praying, but they weren't really praying in faith, were they? <laughs> oh Lord, release him. Release Peter. And there he is at the gate. He's released and they don't even believe it. You know, the Bible says that even when we are faithless, God remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. And so sometimes even when we're praying, and we're not praying in great faith, God hears that and he'll answer it. And so take courage in that. Mark also has links to the Apostle Peter, sorry, to the Apostle Paul and to Barnabas. Colossians 4.10 tells us that Mark was the cousin of Barnabas. Now when Barnabas and Paul set out on their first missionary journey. They took John Mark with them. And their first stop was Cyprus. This was the home of Barnabas. This is where he grew up. And so, probably because of that, Mark had been comfortable there. But when they finished their ministry in Cyprus, they wanted to sail up north into Asia Minor, present-day Turkey, and to do some ministry up in the cities there. And apparently, Mark got afraid or he got homesick and he left them at that point and he went back to Jerusalem. Well, Paul and Barnabas then finished their missionary journey and eventually they ended up in Jerusalem where they had a council, a church council, a very important one, about the grace of God because some people were coming into the church saying, oh no, you can't just accept Jesus and be saved. You must accept Jesus and be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to be saved. So they had this council and they said, no, no. All you have to do is accept Christ and you can be saved. Well, anyway, after that church council, Paul said to Barnabas, hey, why don't we go back and meet all the people that we led to Christ in all these various cities and see the brethren, see the brothers and sisters in Christ and see how they're doing. And so Barnabas said, oh, great. I'll go tell John Mark to pack his bags and join us. And Paul said, no, no, he's not coming with us. You're not going to bring him with us. He left us, don't you remember? He took off. He failed us. He abandoned us in our mission. I'm not going to bring him. And so they started arguing back and forth. In fact, the argument became so heated that they split. And Barnabas took John Mark and he went to Cyprus to do some more ministry. 
John or Paul took Silas and they went up to Antioch and then around to Asia Minor and did some ministry that way. Well, there's a very interesting comment that Paul makes at the very end of his life in the last book that he wrote, Second Peter, or sorry, Second Timothy, chapter four. At the end of his life, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, I want you to come to Rome and I want you to bring John Mark with you. And he says this, for he is useful for me in ministry. And I, I look at this and I think, oh, the grace of God. Isn't that wonderful? Have you ever blown it in your Christian life? Have you ever completely failed the Lord? Have you ever just felt like, you know, I, I'm on the shelf now and that's it. I'm never going to be used again by God. Well, let Mark's story be an encouragement to you. Because at the end of Paul's life, he says, you get John Mark and bring him with you for he is useful to me in ministry. God's a redeemer, people. He can take your broken life, he can take it and mold it and shape it and put it back together again and he can use you. And the Bible says that he's even able to make to restore the years that the locusts have eaten. God is wonderful in that way. He's gracious and kind. Now, that's a little background in the book of Mark and who Mark is. Let's get into it. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. Speaking of John the Baptist. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. This would have been an amazing scene. Thousands and thousands of people coming, confessing their sins openly. And whenever you see true revival, you see people openly confessing their sins. John is baptizing them in the river Jordan. And when he does this, what he's doing is really he's telling the Jewish people that they're living like pagans. You're living like pagans. Because when a pagan would come to, to know God and would be a convert to Judaism, they would take him to a, a ritual bath, to a mikvah, and they would plunge him in and then they would bring him out and that person would be ceremonially clean. They could go and worship the Lord. And so here he is, he's baptizing them in the Jordan River and they're confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey and he preached saying, there comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water but He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, if you've read through the entire Bible, let me ask you this question. Who is the last Old Testament prophet? It's not Malachi. Okay, now, after Malachi, there were 400 years of silence. And then, John the Baptist comes on the scene. And Jesus said in Matthew 11.13 that all the prophets and the law prophesied until John the Baptist. And so the Old, Testament, all, the Old Testament prophets were completed in John the Baptist. His life is really a picture of what the law of God does. Now if we read in Galatians 3.24, I'll read it for you. Galatians 3.24 says, The law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. Now, in Roman times, a tutor or a pedagogue was usually a trusted slave who was in charge of the care and discipline of minor aged children. This pedagogue, this tutor, would dress them, he would feed them, 
He would paddle them if necessary. And he would teach them until they got to a certain age. And once they got to that certain age, when they were old enough, he would take them to school and drop them off where they would mature under a master. The tutor couldn't bring that person to maturity. It could only bring them to the master. Now, if you have a King James Bible, it says, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. That is not a very good translation of that word. It's tutor or overseer, someone who cares for the child until they get to be of age and then he brings them to the school. Now, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. When we talk about being justified. What that means is this. Just if I'd never sinned. God looks at a person who is justified by faith in Christ just if you'd never sinned before. Completely forgiven. The law brings us to Christ. It brings us to the school where Jesus Christ is the master, where he brings us to maturity. The law shows us our need for Christ, but the law can't mature us. The law shows us our sin, but the law can't cleanse us. The law shows us that we are under judgment, but the law can't forgive us. The law shows us that we are dead in sin, but the law cannot give us life. These are only things that Jesus can do. Only Jesus can give life. Only Jesus can forgive. Only Jesus can cleanse us from sin. And so we see John the Baptist as a picture of the law. And like, a, like the law, John the Baptist takes the person and he drops them off at the feet of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ being the one who died on the cross, who paid the penalty for their sins, and who rose again to be their Lord and Savior. And so now... Instead of following the law, what we do is we follow a person. We follow Jesus Christ. How do we do that? Well, look in verse 8 here. He said, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. How do we follow after Jesus Christ? We follow him in the power of the Holy Spirit. When a person receives Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of that person and gives that person power to live for God and to serve God. Now, there are many people who think that the Christian life is just following after a list of do's and don'ts, like the Ten Commandments, or like Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And while God's laws are good, they're right and they're just, Like this picture of John the Baptist, they can only bring us to Christ. They cannot save us. And so what we need is a brand new nature. We need the nature of God living within us. And that's really what Christianity is. It's not an external thing. It's where God comes to live inside of us. Jesus Christ, the hope of glory living inside. And he comes to live inside of us and he starts to change us from the inside out to make us brand new. And so religion always tries to come from the outside in. Jesus comes from the inside out. He changes the heart. And so he says, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Oh, how we need that empowering of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Bible says in Philippians 2.13 that God works in us as Christians both to will and to do for his good pleasure. In other words, he's giving us a desire to obey him and he's also giving us a power to do what pleases him. This is the work of the Spirit of God inside of us. And so we need to rely on the Holy Spirit as we follow after Jesus Christ. Now in verse 9, he says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now, Jesus coming, here's God in human flesh, He comes to be associated with sinful man. When He got baptized, it shows that God wanted to be associated with sinners like us. And He went under the water. Even though Jesus Christ was completely sinless, He became associated with us. He was fully human. And immediately coming up from the water, 
he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Now Jesus Christ here is entering his earthly ministry. He's about 30 years old at this point. And to enter into his ministry, he gets baptized and as he's coming up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descends upon him. It says, descending upon him like a dove. Jesus Christ relied on the power of the Holy Spirit in his own ministry. And so too must we. Let me read to you something out of Philippians chapter 2. He says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. I'm reading out of Philippians 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. In other words, for Jesus to be God wasn't something that he had to grasp or cling on to. He was God completely. He lived, he was God for all eternity before he became a man. And then when he became a man, well, look at what it says there in verse 7. But he made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And so Jesus, being God from all eternity, humbles himself, made himself of no reputation. Another way to look at that is that he emptied himself of his divine privileges. So he veiled himself of his deity, in a sense, when he came to the earth. And so... Here he is, 30 years old. Now he gets baptized and he receives the, the Holy Spirit coming upon him. And if you read in Luke's account, chapter 4, it says then the Spirit of the Lord led him here and empowered him there and did this, these kind of things. He walked in the power of the Holy Spirit, fully relying on the Spirit of God. Now, if Jesus in his ministry relied on the Holy Spirit, how much more should we rely on the power of the Holy Spirit in our ministries, in our lives? Well, then in verse 11, it says, A voice came from heaven. You, who are, my, you are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You notice the Trinity at work here? You see Jesus, God the Son, going into the water. You see him coming out of the water and God the Holy Spirit coming down upon him. And then you hear a voice from heaven, God the Father speaking, you are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. See the Trinity at work here. By the way, notice what he says, you are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You ever wish that God could say those words to you? Well, he does. Are you in Christ today? Have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Well, the Bible says in Ephesians 1.6 that you are accepted in the Beloved. You are accepted in Christ. You are in Christ. And if you're in Christ, He can say to you today, you are my beloved son or you're my beloved daughter and you I am well pleased because you've received Christ by faith. You're in Him. Immediately the Spirit drove Him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Now, in case we think that walking in the power of the Spirit is just sort of skipping from mountain peak to mountain peak, and everything is just fine and dandy, notice what happened. Jesus comes up, he's baptized. And then the Spirit of God comes upon him and immediately the Spirit drove him where? Into the wilderness. And he was there tempted by Satan 40 days. Now, we, if, if we receive Christ and we're baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit and we're led by the Spirit, we are often going to go into times of valley times of wilderness, times of trials and temptations. They may be physical battles, maybe battling a sickness or some kind of disease. But mostly, I think, 
This is what happens to us, especially in this culture. They're mental battles. The battle is in our mind. Satan's, one of Satan's greatest weapons is lies and deception and division. He wants to divide us here. He doesn't want us to be in love with one another. He doesn't want us to be united in one. He wants to divide us. Maybe you too have had these thoughts. Just comes up sort of out of the blue. Wonder why he said that two weeks ago. What did she mean by that? And Satan starts to play on your mind. These little thoughts that, you know, sort of come up and you think, well, where did that come from? Starts to play. Lies and deception. How did we fight against that? Well, the key to it is this. Is to meditate on those things that are true. On those things that are lovely. On those things that are a good report. Philippians 4 verse 8. Meditating. Meditating is not some sort of Eastern religious philosophy where we just go out into the desert and sit in the lotus position and just go, oh, like that. That's not just meditation. They rip that off from the Bible. Meditation is where we meditate on the things of God. We meditate on the Word of God. It doesn't go into the, the, um, how Jesus fought the devil here, but in, if you read in Luke's account, but also in, in Matthew's account, it says that the devil came and three times tempted Jesus. And Jesus... Answered him each time, it is written, it is written, it is written. He quoted the word of God to him. But I want to say something here. To fight the enemy is not just having an intellectual knowledge of the word of God. It's not just having it memorized. It's living the word of God. That's how we fight the devil. Your word have I hidden in my heart where life is that I might not sin against you. When I was a, a younger Christian... There was, a, there was an older guy who took me under his wing and discipled me for a year. We met every Friday morning. We'd read the Bible and we'd pray together. And one time, he was teaching me about this concept. And he, he said, you know, Doug, I have a friend of mine who has memorized the entire book of Romans. But he's shacking up with a girl down at the YMCA. And he put his finger right in my chest, you know, just to make the point. You need to learn. To live the Word of God. Not just to know it intellectually. Not just to be you know, a know-it-all, but to be a person who lives it out. And so, Jesus was immediately driven to, by the Spirit into the wilderness. He was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. This is interesting. Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, was tempted by Satan. You know, temptation is not a sin. (coughs) Jesus was tempted, but without sin. He never sinned once. Temptation is only a sin when we give in to the temptation. And I think this is interesting, because Jesus doesn't just know just because he's God and he's, he's got all knowledge. He doesn't just know about what we go through. He experienced all that we go through. All the temptation, all the trials that we go through, the pain and the suffering that you and I go through. He experienced that. I want to read to you something out of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. It says, For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Jesus suffered being tempted, but he's able to aid us who are tempted. And then in chapter 4, verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus was tempted. He experienced that. And so therefore, because He was, He's able to aid us and help us in our time of need too. 
Then notice too, he was with the wild beasts and angels ministered to him. Let's not forget about the angels. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews 1.14 that angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to us who will inherit salvation. They're here to help us. I believe that we have guardian angels. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 18.10. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, one of these children. For I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Their angels. Their angels. Speaking of a personal angel, I believe a guardian angel. It's interesting, if you read, in fact, I'm going to read it to you. I love this account. 2 Kings chapter 6. In verse 8. Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel and he consulted with his servants saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. And so God is giving Elijah the prophet inside information as to the movements of the Syrian king. And so he tells the king of Israel, don't go there because the, the king of Syria is coming. Well, then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God told him. And thus he warned him and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore, the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Who's, who's the spy here? You know? Who's giving away insider information? Who's telling on me? And one of the servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and get him. And so it was told him, saying, Surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And so he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now he must have been thinking, Oh, wait a minute. Uh, It's just two of us here. And there are masses of people out there. How are we going to fight against them? What are you talking about? He says, there are more who are with us than there are with them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Now he was looking with his physical eyes, but God said, open his spiritual eyes that he can see behind the scenes. And I think if God just somehow just rent the heavens and just tore open the veil so that we could see in the spiritual realm, we would be blown away by what's happening behind the scenes. But know this, there are more with us than there are with them. The Bible says that when Satan fell like lightning from heaven, he took one third of the angels with him. One third. Two third are still left on God's side and they are sent to minister to us and minister for us. Don't forget the angels, people. God is with us. And so, the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. (laughs) Incredible. He could see all the angels, chariots of fire all around. And so the rest of the story is where the, the Syrians came down to him and Elijah prayed that Um, they would be blinded and they were blinded and then he led them blind into Samaria where the king of Israel was with his army. The king of Israel said, do you want me just to kill him? He said, no, you you can't kill him. That wouldn't be fair. Just feed him. Just give him a banquet. And so he gives them this great feast and then after that they stopped raiding Israel anymore. It was a great, great story. 
So, don't forget the angels. God is there. And His angels are there to protect us and to guard us and to keep us in all our ways. And so, the angels ministered to Jesus. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repentance is a word that means to turn around, to do a 180. So if you're going along the road like this and God taps you on the shoulder and says you need to repent, what you do is you turn around. And you turn around and you go God's way. That's what repentance means. Belief is simply to trust. Notice what he says. Believe in the gospel. Trust in the gospel. The gospel means good news. What is the good news? Well, look over in chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What is the good news? The good news is Jesus Christ. He's the good news. There's a Savior who has come and died for sinners like you and me. Who died for all of our sins, past, present and future. Who's coming again to rule and to reign for a thousand years. He's the winner. And we're on His side. Repent and believe in the Gospel, Jesus Christ. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Now, this isn't the first time that Simon and Andrew had seen Jesus. If you read John's account in John chapter 1, Andrew had been with John the Baptist when Jesus was, um, was baptized. And when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said these famous words, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, to a Jew listening on, that would have really piqued their curiosity. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? We know every year that we have to sacrifice the Lamb at Passover. Every year we have to keep doing it, but this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world? One Lamb? And this is the Lamb of God? And so they were like, whoa, what's this? And so they were, their curiosity was piqued. And they went, Andrew and another disciple of John the Baptist went and hung out with Jesus for that day. After that day, Andrew went and he found his brother Peter. And he said, you, you need to come, I found the Messiah. And so he brought him back to Jesus. And so they had been with Jesus already before this time. But this is the time that Jesus asked them now to follow him. Notice what he says. Follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Now, a disciple is to be a fisher of men. In some way, shape or form, a disciple of Christ is going to be looking to bring people to Jesus Christ. He's going to be concerned about people's eternal destiny, whether they're lost or whether they're saved. He's going to want to see his family come to Christ. He's going to want to see his friends, his neighbors, the person at Sainsbury's is checking them out. He's going to be concerned about people that he meets on the street to see that they're saved. He's going to be a fisher of men. If he's not concerned about that, something's wrong. And it's been said... You know, if we ain't fishing, we ain't following. We need to be those who are fishing for men. Some way. And the, this is how you start fishing for men. You get on your knees and you pray for lost people. Pray that God would open their eyes. Pray that God would use you to touch their lives. And watch what He does with your life. Now notice how easy this command is to understand. Follow me. Even a child can understand that. Follow me. It's not a complicated set of directions. It's following a person. Now, when I first moved down here from York, 
Tommy invited me to come over to his house. And at that time, he was living in battle. And he gave me directions. And, and I couldn't actually understand the directions. And so I'm driving around. And fi- finally, I get this phone call. Where are you? Well, I'm, I'm down the street. There's a Ford garage here. And he says, well, you know, just go a little bit more. So I went down and I still couldn't find it. And then turned back around. And I, he called me back and he said, where are you? Well, I'm down by the Ford garage. He said, just wait there and I'll come and you can follow me back, back to my house. And so when he came, it was so easy for me to find the way. You know? And that's the same way it is with us. Follow me, Jesus said. We follow God. We follow him. We follow a person. Now in verse 18, he says, they immediately left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother who also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Notice what they left. Immediately it says they left. They left family to follow Jesus. They left their job to follow Jesus. They left financial security to follow Jesus. They left something they were used to doing. Hey, we've always been fishermen. And now you're going to make us fishers of men? We've never done that before. But they left. And they left their home to follow Jesus. And later on, um, someone said, you know, I'll follow you wherever you go, Jesus. And he said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. This is not our home. That's our home. We're going home to heaven. We're just passing through here. So when he calls a person to follow him, they just they, these guys just left. Now Jesus' call to, to us is total discipleship. He wants all of us. He doesn't just want a part of us. He doesn't want us to hold anything back from Him. Now, of course, this is a process in every person's life. These guys, they failed in many ways. They stumbled. But God picked them back up and renewed them and helped them grow to a greater level of commitment with God. We fail too from time to time. And God will pick us back up and clean us up. And He'll help us follow Him. But oh... What joy, what peace, what love there is when we commit ourselves to following after Jesus Christ without reservation, saying, I'm not going to hold anything back from you. Lord, it's, it's not my life plus a little bit of you, you know, just sort of whipped cream on the top. I'm not going to run my life anymore. I'm going to yield my life to you. Jesus Christ is looking for an exchange. It's your life for his life. I want to read to you a couple things while we close. Because Jesus, when he called people, some of them were following after him for wrong motives. Some of them just wanted things that he was giving them, like food, you know. They wanted to see some cool miracles. But then he started to, to speak on a deeper level about, more, about committing to following him completely. I want to read to you what it says in Matthew 16, verse 25. Well, actually, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The cross is the instrument of death to the individual. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. There's an exchange that takes place. He wants our lives, these miserable, sinful, maybe, maybe we're anxious about things, Whatever it is, he wants to take all that 
And he wants us to yield to him. And he wants to give us his life in exchange. And he says, my life is abundant life. Life to the full, to the max. And so if you seek to save your life, in the end you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for his sake, you'll find it. And then let me read to you Luke 14, verse 25. Now great multitudes went with him. And he turned and he said to them, now picture the scene here. Huge crowds following after Jesus. And he's, you know, I think the temptation would be for us to say, wow, look at my ministry. This is tremendous. All these people following after. And then Jesus goes, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. That's a hard saying. Hate? Now, we need to take this in context. Jesus Christ, God, wrote the Bible. And in the Bible, in the Ten Commandments, it says to honor your father and mother, not to hate them. What does he mean here? Well, I believe that he means in comparison to your devotion to Jesus Christ, your love for him, your love for your parents, your children, your brothers or sisters, is going to be like hate compared to your love for God. He says, if you don't do that, you cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That's an instrument of death to ourselves. My passions, my desires, my plans. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him saying this man began to build and was not able to finish or what man going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000 or else while the other is still a great way off he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace so likewise whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, cannot be my disciple. What is he asking for? He's asking for everything. Everything. All your plans. He's asking for all the things that you consider entertainment. He's asking for your money. Everything. I'm not saying, you know, Come, we're going to take an offering now, you know, that kind of thing. But it's to be yielded to Him, everything that is dear to you. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so, yielding to Christ, following Him, it's simple to understand, isn't it? But boy, the cost is great. And He says you need to count the cost. One time Jesus was walking with the disciples Multitudes were following after him. And he turned around again and he said, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no part with me. And this confused the, the vast majority of the people. What do you mean? Are you some kind of a cannibal? You know? How can we eat your flesh and drink your blood? And he said, Unless you do this, you have no part with me. And some of the people said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And from that point on, many of the disciples who had been following him turned back and didn't follow him anymore. And then Jesus turned to the twelve and he said, do you want to go too? And you know what? I think that every person in their Christian life at some point is asked that question. Do you want to go too? Do you want to go back? Or are you willing to go on with me? No matter how hard it gets, I'll be there with you. But you've got to yield to me. And I think it was Peter who said, Lord, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Where can we go? If we want eternal life, and don't think of eternal life as something you get when you die. Eternal life is what you have the moment you receive Christ. Don't go back to death. Stay with Jesus Christ. Life abundantly. Life eternally. 
Amen? Let us yield ourselves to God today. Let's stand together and pray. Lord, we just want to yield ourselves to You without reservation, Lord. Lord, You said, Come to Me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn from Me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Lord, we want to take your yoke upon us today. Your yoke is easy and your burden is light and we will find rest for our souls. Thank you, Lord. We worship you today. Thank you, God, for each person in here and I pray that you'd just fill them afresh and anew with the power of the Holy Spirit. Living water flowing out from their lives, Lord. Lord, help us to take our cross up and to follow you. To yield all of our future plans, all of our hopes, all of our dreams. To lay them down and say, Lord, I'm living for you now. And we say together, to God be the glory. Be glorified in our lives today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.